what is the soul of St. John's? I got asked that question a couple of years ago when I was doing some online continuing education. The workshop leader, Susan Beaumont, says that institutions like churches have a spiritual essence, a divine spark that she calls the soul of a church. And she asked us to spend some time trying to glimpse the soul of our churches. She said to go to the place where your church is most fully itself, where the essence of your community is. Sit or stand there and pray silently for a while and notice what comes to you. Susan said, I know it sounds woo-woo, but try it and see what happens. <laughs> the place where the essence of St. John's is, for me, is here in our historic nave. So I walked in here one afternoon when no one was around, and I sat in the pew over there, right about where Len is sitting today. In the quiet, I breathed and I prayed. I asked God to show me the soul of this parish. And what I noticed was this sense of a community pulling together for the common good. I should have expected that because that's our history, a community pulling together for the common good. When the Kilbourne, Pinney, Stewart, Beach, Little, Griswold, and Andrews families and others arrived here in late 1803 to the land they'd purchased on what was then called the Whetstone River in the brand new state of Ohio, they were kind of on their own. Native American hunting parties camped sometimes at a stream close by, but there were no villages of native or white people near the new town of Worthington. Whatever the settlers needed for their community, cabins, fields for crops, vegetable gardens, a sawmill, a grist mill, they were going to have to build it themselves without any outside help. As they carved a town out of the forest, they thought about what would benefit the whole community, not just individuals. Within a few months of arriving in Ohio, the settlers founded a Masonic Lodge, a school, a library, and on the 6th of February, 1804, they held the first service for this church. Not everyone had children. Not everyone could read. Not everyone was Episcopalian. But the founders of Worthington wanted the school, the library, and the church to be here for the common good. The name they chose for the church was St. John's Church in Worthington and parts adjacent. It's still the legal name of St. John's. This has always been a church not just for Worthington, but for all those who live nearby. A church for the common good. And this community kept on pulling together for the common good. St. John's worshipped in the school building for 20-some years. In the late 1820s, Methodists and Presbyterians built churches in Worthington, and St. John's decided to follow suit. Construction took five years, and members of St. John's did all the work by hand, making drawings, plotting out the site, framing the building, floating four perfectly straight black walnut trees down the river from what's now High Banks Metro Park and encasing them in plaster to form the columns, painting the walls, carving the pulpit and pews, feeding the builders, stitching up their cuts and bandaging their scrapes, teaching children how to lay bricks and install glass windows. No one could do this on their own. It took the entire community coming together. The builders of this nave must have hoped this building would long outlive them. They certainly made it sturdy enough. It's the oldest part of our campus and it gives us the fewest problems. We still benefit from that long ago church community pulling together for the common good. For people of the future, they themselves would never meet. Those first generations of St. John's knew their Bibles. They must have noticed how people came together around Jesus for the good of everyone. There wasn't really such a thing as privacy in the first century. People lived in multi-generational fa families with neighbors always in and out of each other's homes. 
So everyone in Capernaum knows that Simon's mother-in-law is desperately ill with a fever. She's scared, and they're scared for her because fevers kill people, and there isn't much anyone can do besides bring soup and sit with her and pray for her. So when word ripples out from the synagogue in Capernaum about the evil spirit Jesus has just driven out of a man, the first people, per first person people think about is Simon's mother-in-law. Surely Jesus can heal her. So they tell Jesus about her. They ask him to help. And they bring him to her. Jesus comes into the sick room, looks at the weak, sweaty woman lying on the bed with compassion. And he takes her hand and raises her up. The fever leaves her. She feels cool for the first time in days. She's so fully healed, she doesn't need to recuperate. Immediately, she gets out of bed and begins to serve them, as the angels did for Jesus in the wilderness, as Jesus himself does, the one who came not to be served, but to serve. The community that's forming around Jesus witnesses this second healing, and right away they bring all the sick people in Capernaum to him. This community around Jesus is pulling together for the common good. Jesus can't be everywhere at once. He relies on his followers to be his ears and eyes and hands and heart in the world. The body of Christ is bringing the healing and hope and new life they find in Jesus to everyone, no matter who they are. On its 220th anniversary, St. John's looks pretty different than it did that first service on a cold February morning on the Ohio frontier. From a few dozen members, we've grown to over 400. Women and men both serve in our clergy and lay leadership. Children are a lively and visible presence in our parish. We have more ethnic and racial diversity than the all-white founders did. We have a preschool and a playground and a modern columbarium wall. We've added to our facilities as our needs have changed. We have electricity and forced air heating, and we don't have to leave the building to use the restroom anymore, thank God. <laughs> but I think our founders would be proud that St. John's is still here, still on the village green, still thriving and vibrant, still embracing that ethos of the common good. Our founders would see it in our mission statement. The words for it may be new, but our mission is what it has been for a long time, to grow, heal, and serve with God's wisdom, love, and joy. And our founders would see the common good in the way we've handled recent medical emergencies on Sunday mornings. We stepped in and took care of people who needed help without making a fuss about it, because that's what followers of Jesus do. And I think our founders would be proud that St. John's is still the body of Christ pulling together for the common good. 220 years on, the soul of St. John's is the same as it has always been. The body of Christ pulling together for the common good. And 220 years on, the world still needs St. John's to bring hurting people to Jesus, who will take them by the hand and lift them up. So we walk with confidence into our future, growing, healing, and serving with God's wisdom, love, and joy.